Okay, uh, we're going to continue on here, chapter six. Again, uh, this is uh, second exam material. Yeah, um, so first exam should go through, uh, I think just chapter four, which once again is one week from today. We're going to take it, yeah, uh, during lecture, obviously. <clears throat> All right, uh, so in this chapter, we really started talking about naming, and we talked about two different types of compounds. Uh, we talked about ionic compounds, Uh, which is always a metal and a non-metal together. And whenever these two guys pretty much get together, we will have that transfer of electrons. And that creates our cation, which is our positively charged ion for our metal. And it creates our anion, which is our negatively charged uh, ion there for our non-metal. And the importance of this, again, as we talked about, is uh, there's really no sharing of electrons here. It's that electrostatic attraction. Our opposites attract that hold that together. No sharing, basically, of electrons. And we also talked about uh, covalent or molecular compounds. And those guys are usually between two nonmetals. And unlike ionic, it is all about sharing electrons. And as we'll talk about, uh, the sharing of electrons uh, may be equal or may be unequal. And really the type of compound that you have uh, does affect the name. And you pretty much want to sort of start off by figuring out uh, what type of compound you got are you dealing with. Uh, do you have basically a metal and non-metal, which would be ionic, or do you have basically a couple of non-metals, which would be more of a covalent or molecular sort of compound? And ionic guys sort of fall under two types. They're sometimes classified as type one or type two ionic compounds. And I'm pretty sure I mentioned it last time, but pretty much whenever a metal is involved, uh, it's really the most important in terms of how you name things. You always look towards the metal uh, in terms of the proper way to name these guys. So whenever you got that metal involved, uh, you should always really look at the metal and that's sort of where you should focus on. And in a type one compound, it is the metal has basically a fixed positive charge. And those are, are basically group one, uh, group two, group three, aluminum, zinc, cadmium, or silver, which are transition metals, but do have fixed charges. And type two is pretty much the same deal, except that the metal is most likely a varied positive charge. And usually that is going to be a transition metal. are just to the right on the periodic table as we uh, talked about underneath the staircase where we have things like lead, which is PB, we have tin, which is SN. Uh, those guys, again, are not technically transition metals, but they do have a variable type of charge uh, and they're named basically as type two. Now, the big difference between these two is not a tremendous difference in terms of how we name it. Uh, if we have a type one compound, we basically just use the whole name of the metal. And the non-metal, we drop the last part of the name and we put IDE at the end of it. And remember, whenever we write an ionic compound that has both a positive and negative charged ion that's coming together, which is what an ionic compound is, uh, there's a couple of things that we should always follow, and that is it is always the positive guy first, followed by the negative. So always the cation followed by the anion. And that goes for both the name and also the formula. Secondly, when we do write a formula for an ionic compound, it should never have a charge. So although it is made up of two things that do have charges, uh, you should always balance out the positive charge and the negative charge so that it equals zero. And again, the real reason for that, as we might have touched upon uh, last time, is that allows everybody to really become a very stable sort of situation 
become like noble gases when you sort of get everybody to an equal charge of zero or an overall charge of zero when you put them together. So when we write something like NaCl, which would be a metal and a non-metal, and an example of a type one metal, which is sodium, because sodium is group number one. And the other thing we talked about, obviously, is everybody in group one is plus one. Everybody in group two is plus two. Aluminum, for the most part, there in group three uh, is plus three. We then skip group four. We go to group five. And now we're talking about the non-metals on top of the staircase, upper part of the staircase, uh, above the staircase, I guess the way you say that. Uh, it goes minus three, uh, minus two for group uh six and minus one for group seven. So it's kind of like uh, one, two, three, skip and go backwards, three, two, one. Uh, remember that again, the transition metals have a varied charge except for three exceptions, which are these three exceptions that I listed. Zinc and cadmium are always plus two and silver is always plus one. So they, are fall, they do fall under type one compounds, uh, even though again, they are um, transition metals. So, this is a proper formula because the cation here, again, is sodium with a plus one charge. And the anion formula is Cl minus. And again, plus one and minus one will give us no charge when we put them together. So once we see that metal, we could go right into the name of the whole name. And then IDE at the end of it. For type two, we pretty much do the same thing, except because the metal can have a varied charge, we do use the whole name of the metal. We do use Roman numerals to indicate the charge on the metal, and then the non-metal gets the IDE treatment uh, at the end of it there. And the deal on that is you do have to sort of figure out what the charge is on the individual metal, a reminder that the Roman numeral is not how many metals you have, which is a very common mistake that people make. It is if you took one of the metals out by itself, uh, what the positive charge would be on it. So again, that is what the Roman numeral basically indicates. The good news on those type two is uh, whatever it is attached to, you will definitely know uh, the charge of. So if we have something like CuCl2, when we look at this, that is a metal. That is again, a non-metal. So that automatically again, should direct you to an ionic compound. And once again, looking at the metal, which is copper, which is a transition metal, that then should direct you to it being a type two compound that you need to figure out the charge on the copper in this case. So what we do know in this case is we do have one copper we do know for sure that Cl is group seven, which means it has a minus one charge. And once again, here, there are two of them, uh, which would give us not again, Cl two minus, but two individual Cl minuses is basically what we have there. That gives us a grand total of minus two. And again, to balance it out, that would mean in this particular case, Again, the copper here would have to have a plus two charge to balance it out. Once you sort of determine that, that's pretty much all you need to name at this point. We are once again going to use the whole name here of the metal, which is our copper. We're going to Roman numeral to it because, again, of the positive charge that we see on the copper. And the other main thing that people screw up on a lot is they see multiples of this. They want to use prefixes. And again, no prefixes in any of this ionic naming. Uh, so it doesn't matter how many of those Cl minuses you have, it will just be chloride at the end. So it doesn't have any effect on the name. Um, <clears throat> the last type of naming that we finished up at the end there um, was type three. And type three are covalent, are two non-metals together. So again, these are the guys who are gonna be sharing electrons. And as I mentioned, this is really where prefixes do come in. And that is where you should use it. Uh, we talked about a couple of things that we do not use. For example, we do not use the prefix mono on the first name, uh, but you can use it on the second name. And very commonly as well, a couple of vowels sort of back up to each other. The two main culprits there is uh, again, mono uh, first name. And uh, A and O are an O and an O. And again, we typically will drop the sort of vowel from the prefix uh, when we have that situation sort of occurring. 
These are, again, the easiest, as we hopefully saw there towards the end last time, because really there's nothing to balance. There's nothing to sort of figure out in terms of charges or anything like that. You basically just got to pick the correct prefix and basically um, write what's there. Now, we do use the prefix if necessary on the first name, and we also use the whole name of the first element. And the second one, we also use a prefix and it gets the normal sort of ending with the IDE at the end of it. So again, if we had something like NO2, that's a non-metal, that's a non-metal. So uh, nitrogen, oxygen are both non-metals. That should move you to a type three compound. And really at that point, it's just picking up the right prefixes to use. Uh, that is mono for that guy because there's only one. That is di for that guy. And again, here we do not use mono on the first name. So we would just use the whole name of the element, which is nitrogen. We will use our prefix here and turn our oxygen into the IDE at the end. And we end up with nitrogen dioxide. Any questions on any of that naming stuff there that we talked about last time? <clears throat> Okay, so we kind of did some off the cuff sort of examples for type three. So let's take a look at some of the ones we got here in the notes. Uh, this is a table again of those prefixes that we talked about. And the major thing again, mono, okay on the second, but not on the first. And we typically do drop the A, R and O if they back up to another vowel. Uh, two I's are actually okay. Typically we do leave two I's, uh, but again, that A and the O or the O and the O are really the ones that we watch out for. And that's what we see here. Uh, we have, again, I said a tetraoxide. We drop the, our tetraoxide, I'm sorry, we drop the A there from the prefix. And said, again, monoxide. It's just monoxide. So we drop the O in this case. We do have some common name stuff. And again, definitely H2O is water. Ammonia is NH3. And we could add to this list that we saw, I think, earlier, methane, which is CH4. So those are three really guys that should always name, uh, again, by its common name. No dihydrogen monoxide or anything like that. Again, for water, just put water in. As I may have said last time, move on with your life. Yeah, so it'll be all right. All right, so why don't you try some here, see what you come up with. And let me give you some to write the formulas. I think we did these last time, so we'll do a few here. Let's do, um, let's do carbon tetrachloride. Let's do oxygen. Except bromide. We'll just make up some things that maybe don't exist, but we'll do it for the naming part of it. Um, let's do nitrogen trioxide. All right. So uh, names on the left there, proper formulas there on the right. Okay, let's take a look and see how we're doing. Uh, again, uh, the first thing you really want to look at whenever you're trying to name anything or write a formula is again, to try to identify what you're dealing with. Uh, so I see I and I see O, those are both non-metals which should direct you again to type three like we've been talking about. And once you see that, it should be is probably the fastest things that you name because there's nothing to figure out other than pick the right sort of prefix. So I'm going to look here and go to which the prefix is die. We're going to use the whole name there of the first element with its iodine. And again, here, the two eyes are okay. Uh, here, the prefix is seven, which is hepta. And then this guy gets the IDE treatment here. We are going to drop the a from the prefix, so we don't get that AO that backs up to each other, and we'll end up with this diiodine heptoxide there. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> Taking a look at the next one, carbon nonmetal, oxygen nonmetal, so once again, type three. 
Uh, there is only one carbon, which means the prefix would be mono, but we do not use it on the first name. So we're just gonna use carbon. Here we have two oxygens. So the prefix is going to be di. So that's gonna be dioxide. So carbon dioxide on that one. Here we see phosphorus and we see chlorine, which again are both non-metal. So that should tell you it is a type three. Don't have to worry about anything again here than picking the right prefixes. So again, uh, we do have one of the phosphorus, which means mono would be our prefix. And again, we're not going to use it on the first name. So this would just be phosphorus. Uh, we have three of the CLs. So that's going to be a tri. And again, ID at the end of it, a little phosphorus trichloride in this case. Any questions? Yeah. Roman numerals are only for when you have a metal and a non-metal and only for when the metal is a transition metal or just to the right. So, and that's because again, they could have a very sort of positive charge. So you have to tell somebody in this case, we're talking about the one with the plus two or plus three. So it's only specifically for metal, non-metal where the metals of transition metal can have multiple charges. Other questions? All right, then what I probably think is the fastest of any naming is this one here on the right, which is here's the name and write the formula. So I see carbon tetrachloride. As soon as I see the prefixes, really that's probably all I need to know. It's a type three. So carbon with no prefix means one. Tetra's prefix is four and chloride is Cl. So a little CCL4 and we are done. Di and hexa tells me I'm in a type three sort of category happening here. So di is two, oxygen is O. Hexa is six and bromide is Br. So in this made up thing here, we got a little bit of that happening there. Uh, here, nitrogen, no prefix, but I again, do see a prefix here. And I also hopefully will know nitrogen and oxygen are both non-metals. So again, that's gonna be a type three compound. So no prefix on the nitrogen means there's one, three for the tri and O. We'll just do NO3 there. Any questions on type three naming? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so with type three specifically, you do, um, you name it based on the formula. So whichever element comes first in the formula, that's the order at which you should name it. And same thing with the name, whichever sort of element comes first in the name is how you should put it into a formula. So it's always sort of whatever is written in that order for type three. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, so a review of those three that we just talked about, uh, type one, type two. Type one, metal, non-metal, no Roman numeral needed. Type two, metal, non-metal, Roman numeral needed because of the metal. Type three, no Roman numeral, only prefixes. They never cross over. So again, if you find yourself prefixing things and Roman numeraling, you probably should put some X's on it, yes, because it's probably going to be wrong. So never cross those things over. There's just a very rare, uh, rare spot where you could end up with a prefix and a Roman numeral, but it's because the actual substance has a prefix in its name. And we'll see it in just a second. But uh, other than that, really shouldn't cross over anything between those two. Here's a decision tree in case you need to make a decision. Uh, but pretty much if a metal is present, it's going to be one of those guys. And if there's no metal, you should go the type three route and use your prefixes. So let's talk about polyatomic ions to finish our naming extravaganza here. So polyatomic ions are ions, uh, but they are actually groups of non-metals that actually share electrons. So they're kind of weird things. They are guys that actually share electrons. So polyatomic ions are actually non-metals that are sharing electrons to be held together. But overall, because of how they're hooked together, they actually end up with a charge. So they're ions as well. And if we take something like this, NH4, NO3, we could actually break it right about there. And there's actually two polyatomic ions here. This guy right here is NH4 plus. And this guy right here is NO3 minus. This one nitrogen and four hydrogens. 
they are actually covalently bonded sharing of electrons and they never break apart into the individual little guys by themselves. They move around as units and the overall thing has a plus one charge. Same thing here with our NO3 minus that one nitrogen and those three oxygens are sharing electrons together. They never break apart into the individual elements or anything like that. Uh, they basically move as a unit. We will see this in a bit here, but if you draw the Lewis structures for these guys, this guy, those guys are all sharing electrons and has an overall charge of plus one. This guy here, I'll give it the old college try, see how I do. There we go, a little bit of that. Looks something like this. Again, all those guys are sharing electrons, has a minus one charge. That is why when we put together both of those things, we're essentially still putting together something with a plus one charge and a minus one charge, even though there's a lot of stuff there. And that means when I take plus one and minus one, I get zero, which is what I want when I put it together, right? Anytime you put anything that is positive one and negative one together, you get an overall charge of zero. So that is why the formula here is basically one of each of these. Yeah. So it really is two things together. And that guy has a positive charge on the left there and a negative charge on the right. Now these polyatomic ions have special names. This guy right here is what is known as the ammonium ion, not to be confused with ammonia, which is NH3, no charge. So NH3 that we just saw a second ago has no charge as ammonia. This guy with a charge and an extra hydrogen is NH4 plus and does have a charge. This guy is our good friend nitrate. And polyatomic ions uh, have special names and formulas. And basically when a polyatomic ion is involved, you just use the whole name. So in this case, this guy would be ammonium. And this guy's name is nitrate. So this would be ammonium nitrate. And you use the whole polyatomic ion. And by the way, much like a lot of things, doesn't matter how many you have of them, you just use the name. So if you had like two of the nitrates, it would just be called nitrate as well. Again, we don't impose any type of prefix or anything like that. Now, a majority of all polyatomic ions are pretty much negative. And they pretty much have negative, they pretty much have a negative charge there. And that means that in most cases, there's very few sort of positive polyatomic ions. Ammonium is one of the few, uh, there's a couple others, but what usually happens because polyatomic ions are negatively charged is they usually go find a metal and they're usually hooked up with a metal. So a lot of times when we're dealing with polyatomic ions, we oftentimes will fall back to our type one and type two rules, which means you oftentimes will find yourself with a metal and a polyatomic ion together. And as we mentioned earlier, whenever a metal is involved, it is the most important thing. So we would follow our same rules that we were talking about with type one and type two, which means if the metal is a fixed positive charge, group one, group two, group three, zinc, cadmium, or silver, you don't need a Roman numeral. So you just use the whole name of the metal and the whole name of the polyatomic ion. If your metal is a transition metal or just to the right there, just like before, you use the whole name of the metal, you'll need a Roman numeral and you use the whole name of the polyatomic ion. So for example, if I take NaNO3, we break this apart right about there and right about there. This is Na, which is group one, means it has a plus one charge. This is our nitrate that we just saw, which is NO3 minus, once again, minus one plus one, which is why we just need one of those. I see a metal involved here, and that metal needs a Roman numeral or no Roman numeral? No Roman numeral because it has a fixed charge. So we would just name it like we did type one, sodium. And once again, here, we would use the whole name of the polyatomic ion. So nine times out of 10, maybe even more than that, uh, you probably will fall back to those type one, type two rules when you're dealing with polyatomic ions. For example, if we had this here, for example, 
we'll use our same guy. Let's say we had this, FeNO3. <clears throat> here, I'll put it up a little bit higher. We'll come up here, FeNO3. We have basically two things here. We have We have our iron, which is a metal, and we have our nitrate, which is our polyatomic ion. So the metal, once again, is the most important thing. And do I need a Roman numeral for iron? I do because it's a transition metal. So we would follow the same sort of pattern that we did before. All right. I don't know what the charge is. But once again, we do know that nitrate, as we can see here, is NO3 minus, right? And there's not just one of them, but there are three of them right and that would mean if we drew them all out that's a grand total of how much negative charge negative three which means my iron in this case should be positive three to balance it out so we do the exact same thing that we did with type one and type two just the polyatomic ions a little bit bigger and we would name it the same way so this would be iron roman numeral three because of the charge on the metal and although we do have three of the nitrates, it is still just nitrate. And obviously that would be named as a type two sort of compound. Question on that. Now, while we're looking at this, let's take a look at uh, the way I wrote it, the formula there. I wrote the formula like this with parentheses, as you could probably see. And the reason I need parentheses is if I wrote the formula like so, FeNO333, what does that imply? That I have 33 oxygens, which is clearly, if we look over here, not the case, right? I only got three, six, nine oxygens. So whenever you have more than one polyatomic ion, you got to put parentheses around the polyatomic ion, and you need to put the number on the bottom that indicates how many of those you have. Otherwise, you have like way too many oxygens and not enough nitrogens in this particular case. Any question on that? So that's something to keep in mind. If you do have more than one polyatomic ion, you got to put parentheses around them. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> So here's a table of some polyatomic ions. In fact, I think there's three tables of polyatomic ions in case we get bored. All right. But uh, here's the bad news. It's just like stuff you got to learn. Yeah. So you got to learn the formulas and you have to learn the names and the charges. Otherwise, it makes it really hard to kind of put them together correctly. So um, there are ways that you can help yourself learn them. There are usually when you look at polyatomic ions, groups of polyatomic ions that are really related to each other. Uh, so, for example, we were just looking at our NO3 minus, which is nitrate AT. And again, that is the three oxygens and one nitrogen together with minus one charge. There's also NO2 minus, which is one nitrogen and two oxygens. And that is known as nitrite IT. There's something like SO4 two minus, that's four oxygens and one sulfur with a minus two charge. That is what is known as sulfate AT. There's also SO3 two minus, which has three oxygens and one sulfur and minus two charge, which is sulfite. Now, the only difference between say these groups of two here they are both, in this case, has a minus one charge, right? The only difference is the number of oxygens, yeah? So the one that has, for example, down here, this has the same minus two charge. The only difference is the number of oxygens, right? So in a group of two, the one that has the most oxygens usually will end in eight, ATE. So this guy has three oxygens and this one has four oxygens in that group of two. So they end in eight. The one with the least amount of oxygens in a group of two that are related to each other ends in it. Yeah. So you could think like you ate too much. Yes. That's the one with the most oxygens is a way to remember that. Um, now there are also groups of four that are related to each other. <clears throat> 
And the most common group of four is this group of four right here. And that is ClO4 minus, ClO3 minus, C, C maybe, LO2 minus, and ClO minus. All four of those guys all have a minus one charge. And again, everything else stays together. This whole thing's all sharing electrons and stays together. The only difference between all four of those things is the number of what? Oxygens. So we could follow our same rule, basically. We could kind of break it right about there. And we know to the right are the ones that have the least number of oxygens, right? So they should end in ite, right? I-T-E. So for example here, let me just erase some of this. So I got somewhere to write that there. So if we look at the ones on the right, uh, this guy should be chlorite, I-T-E. This guy should be chlorite. Clearly you cannot have the same name for two different things. So when you have a group of four that are related to each other, the one with the least number of oxygens in that group of four will end in ite and also start with hypo. So that is known as hypochlorite. And then we have chlorite in the guy to the left there. Now, if we go to the guys on the left-hand side here, those are the two that have the most oxygens, which means they should end in eight, A-T-E. So this guy here would be chlor eight. This guy here would be chlor eight. Once again, we can obviously not have the same name for two different things. So in a group of four, the one with the most oxygens will actually start with per in front of it. So that is perchlorate. So that is perchlorate, chlorate, chlorite, and hypochlorite, which is probably the most common group of four that you can come across. By the way, the CL is a halogen, yeah? can actually swap out that for any halogen you want and they're named the same way. So let's just say I had not ClO3 minus, but BrO3 minus, what would this name be? Instead of chlorate, it would be bromate. Yeah, so it works the same way. Yeah. Oh, if you put in I in there, IO3 minus, it would be iodate. Yeah, so you could swap out that halogen in any of those four for any other halogen is they're basically named the same way. So how can this help you? Well, you could either, you know, bite the bullet and just remember everything, which I don't know, could work for some people, I suppose. But some people will remember all the eights, for example, what the eights formulas are, and know that if you needed an ide, it's just frankly one oxygen less. Everything's the same, right? Or you could remember all the ites and know that if you needed an eight, you just add an oxygen to it. So you can sort of remember it that way, either one or the other, and know, okay, well, if I needed uh, like the eight or one more oxygen or it has one more oxygen, then it's going to be the eight version of it. Uh, so, for example, if we had something like PO43 minus, this is uh, phosphate, ATE, what would PO33 minus be, you think? It would be phosphite, right? It has one oxygen less, right? They both are minus three, they both have one phosphorus. If I remember that this is phosphate, and I have this guy that has one less, that means it's less than that, it should be the ITE, and it becomes phosphite. So again, that's a good way to sort of uh, manage it. Um, there are a couple other things that you'll see on this table as I start scribbling through the table, but uh, we sometimes will put an H plus in front of something. And for example, if we had CO3 two minus, that is carbonate. And if I put an H plus with it, it becomes HCO3 minus, which is basically H is what? Hydrogen. So this is what is known as hydrogen carbonate. Because frankly, I put an H in front of it. By the way, the charge changed because I added together minus two and plus one gives you 
minus one left over, right? So if you take uh, together the charge, it will actually change. By the way, just a few things. Unfortunately, this is very commonly also known as bicarbonate. In case you got heartburn, like you got right about now, yes, uh, is bicarbonate, uh, which is very commonly still used. So if you see bicarbonate, is the same thing as hydrogen carbonate, and those two are used very much commonly still. And the same thing right there with hydrogen sulfate or sulfite or sulfate. Uh, you'll see the bi kind of used as well sometimes. So if you see here bisulfate, it's the same as hydrogen sulfate. So a vast majority of these polyatomic ions will end in either eight or eight. You do have some groups of four. Again, the chlorine one is probably the most common one where you do have to add the hypo and the per, depending on sort of where you land. Now, there are some polyatomic ions that actually do not end in either eight or eight. And that is like our guy right here that's cribbled all over, uh, which is hydroxide. And if we look at OH minus here, that is hydroxide and that ends in IDE. But again, a vast majority of those polyatomic ions will end in either eight or eight. Any questions on that there? All right, so let me find a table here that's cleaner and then we'll take a look maybe at this one. All right, so these are pretty much, these tables have very similar ones on each one. There's just some different tables and stuff, but uh, since it's not all written on, why don't you try naming some of these? Let's do, um, let us do, we'll do this one, yeah, so. Let's do something. I don't know. Let's do Na2SO4. Let's do um, CuOH2. Let's do uh, MgCO3. All right, so give the names of those, and then why don't you try writing the formulas for, uh, let's do iron to phosphate. Potassium chloride. And let's do ammonium sulfide. All right, so on the left there, proper formulas. On the right, we'll start on the right-hand side, why not? All right, so uh, we're gonna start over here, give some names. So again, same approach. We wanna identify what we're dealing with. And I do see sodium, which is a metal. I see SO4, which at some point you will hopefully know is sulfate. And that is a polyatomic ion. So once again, as soon as I see the metal, as we've been talking about, that's really all I need to sort of worry about and sort of think about in a sense. And that metal is what type of metal? Type one or type two? It is a type one metal. It has a fixed charge, right? So I do not need Roman numerals for that. So really at that point, I'm just gonna write what's there. And I could use the whole name here, which would be sodium. And once I learn here in my table there that SO42 minus is sulfate, we just use the whole name here. And much like we did with type one, it doesn't really matter if there's more than one of those guys. Again, we're not going to use a prefix. So never use a prefix here. Speaking of that, this is uh, one of the only places I was mentioning earlier. Uh, it is possible you could have a Roman numeral and a prefix together. Uh, so for example, the name of this guy is dihydrogen, right? And so that polyatomic ion has a prefix in the name. And that would be probably the only place where a prefix and a Roman numeral could come together. And that's only because it's part of the polyatomic ion's name. Other than that, there should be no prefixes sort of coming into play. Um, here, we're going to look at this, which is copper and a polyatomic ion, OH minus, which is hydrogen hydroxide let's spit that out i think right there and uh, again here since the metals involved we're going to focus in on it and this metal do i need to worry about it and i do because it is a transition metal so we do need to figure out the charge uh so if we come up here we have copper and there's just one of them this is oh and as we can see here that is oh minus 
and there's not one of them, but there are two of them, which means that gives us a grand total of minus two. <clears throat> that means the copper here does have to be plus two to balance it out. And that would then give me a copper Roman numeral two, once again, for the charge. And although there are multiples of the OH, doesn't affect the name, I'll just write it underneath since I'm running out of room there, uh, will be hydroxide. So copper two hydroxide in that case. By the way, the first one here, sodium is group one, has a plus one charge. That is why there are two of them, right? To balance out the minus two charge of the sulfate, right? So that's why on the first formula, we have two of the sodiums written there. Any questions on that name? <clears throat> Coming to the bottom here, we see magnesium, which is a metal. CO3 is carbonate, uh, which is a polyatomic ion. And in this case here, magnesium is group number two, which means it has a fixed positive two charge. So that's all I need to know about that. And I'm gonna go magnesium. And once again, here, we're going to use the whole name of our CO3 two minus. Uh, which is carbonate in this case. And we have no charge here because magnesium is a plus two and carbonate here is CO3 two minus. So minus two plus two, they balance each other out. Just need one of each of those. Any questions on any of that? Also a good example there on the bottom. If you just have one polyatomic ion, you don't need to put parentheses around it. People always want to do that, you know, just put parentheses, but you don't need to if you just have one, but obviously if you have more than one, you do need to put the parentheses uh, like we see in the middle one, for example. Any questions on any of those names? <clears throat> All right, so now we're going to write the formula here. So we're going to work the same way. Iron Roman numeral two means that my iron has a plus two charge, right? So that is what the Roman numeral means. Phosphate is one of our polyatomic ions. It's right about there. And that is PO4, three minus. So essentially in this case, I am putting together a plus two and a minus three, which means the common number we need to get to is six in this case. And just like we did previously, to get my iron to six, I need not one, not two, but I need three of them to get me to a plus six. And to get my phosphate to six, I need two of them to there. Now that we did that, just like before, we just write what we have there. So we have uh, one, two, three of these guys. So that's a Fe3. We have one and two of these guys, but that is a polyatomic ion, which means I do need to put a parentheses and the polyatomic ion inside and on the bottom there, the number of how many I have. Yeah. Any questions on that formula there? All right, so looking at potassium chloride, uh, potassium is group one, uh, has a fixed positive charge of plus one. Chloride is one of those group of four that we were looking at, it's this guy right there which is ClO2 minus. In this case, I'm basically putting together plus one and minus one, which means I just need to put them together, right? So that's gonna be KClO2. Again, no need for parentheses here as there's only one of them. <clears throat> Lastly, ammonium sulfide. I'll go up towards the top here. Ammonium is a polyatomic ion. Again, one of the few positive guys, and that is NH4 plus. Sulfide is what? Sulfide IDE most likely comes from the periodic table it is sulfur. Yeah. So it is sulfur group six, which is minus two. Yeah. So again, most often if it's IDE, it's probably one of those elements from the periodic table. There are a few, there are polyatomic ions, but that is what we're putting together here. So we're taking a plus one and a minus two. So in this case, to get us to balance it out, we need one more of our ammoniums, right? That'll give us a plus two to balance out the minus two. And since again, that is a polyatomic ion, I do need to put the parentheses and I do need to put the number on the bottom to say how many I have. And since I only have one of those, just one of those will do. There we go. 
So as you can kind of see here, in most cases, your polyatomic ion is going to probably be hooked up with a metal, and we just kind of fall back to our type one, type two rules. Any questions on polyatomic ions? They're responsible for the ones that are in the table in your book, yes, and whatever it says on the review sheet as to which ones you should know. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay. That was fun naming, I think. Uh, this is a slide of what we sort of talked about a second ago, so I'll just put it up here so uh, you can see it. But again, in our group of four, we do add the additional per for the one with the most oxygens and hypo for the one with the least. And then obviously uh, our hydrogen added in there, which is really H plus is why the charge changes as well. Again, hydrogen carbonate are sometimes referred to as bicarbonate as well. All right, so that is our naming. Now to switch gears and talk about bonding, which is part of what's going on with our naming. So I think we saw this earlier, but we do use Lewis dot symbols, which once again are sometimes referred to as electron dot symbols uh, to help us basically draw both types of bonding, uh, which is uh, either ionic bonding or covalent bonding. And as I think we saw perhaps in the last chapter, these slides I think popped in, uh, it is the symbol and again, really no more than two dots per side. And uh, that gives us our Lewis dot symbol or electron dot symbol uh, to use. These are valence electrons, which are those outermost electrons. They are the ones, again, that are involved in bonding. Remember, there's kind of two types of electrons. There's core electrons, which are the electrons that are closer to the nucleus, not involved in bonding because they're held really tightly. And there are valence electrons, which are the ones that are involved in bonding uh, because frankly, they're not as close to the nucleus and they're not held as tightly. So again, if we look at something like sodium, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 electron configuration, 3s1, these are the core electrons, not involved in bonding. This is sodium's one valence electron. Uh, which is involved in bonding. And I think we also talked about it that the fastest way to figure out valence electrons, right, is it is equal to the group number. So the number of valence electrons equals the group number. Except for our helium there, as I think we might also touched upon last time, Helium, again, although it is part of group eight, only has two total electrons, which means it can't have more than two. So it has two valence electrons, but everybody else in uh, group eight will have eight valence electrons. The good news is uh, we don't really deal too much in bonding with the uh, transition metals. So you don't have to worry about any of that type of stuff for those guys. So here's again, uh, something I made when I was bored, should get a hobby, but uh, this is again, here's some Lewis dot symbols for all these things. And the goal really of all bonding, as I mentioned a number of times, and as we'll see as we go through this, is really for everybody, again, to achieve what's sometimes referred to as noble gas configuration, which means that they basically end up with the same sort of electron arrangement as a noble gas, which is our guys in group eight. And that's because noble gases are really stable. They're chemically inert. And that's sort of the goal of all bonding, both ionic bonding and also covalent bonding where they share electrons. And that's why eight is like a magic number because eight gets pretty much everybody there to the noble gases. And also, as I might've mentioned the other day, hydrogen should only need to get to helium. And that's why hydrogen never, ever, one more time again, ever have more than two electrons to it. Uh, so don't put more than two electrons for hydrogen because uh, it will definitely be wrong. <clears throat> so when we use Lewis dot symbols, uh, it helps us draw uh, really compounds that are both ionic and covalent. And it's a little different at how we draw each of these sort of compounds, depending on if it is an ionic bond or it is a covalent compound, which is also sometimes referred to as a molecular compound. Basically, the difference here is uh, transfer of electrons, which makes our cation an anion, and no sharing of electrons. So no sharing of electrons between those. And here is basically our two nonmetals, 
and our sharing of electrons. And by the way, ionic compound, always metal and nonmetal. So it's pretty much without question, if you see a metal and a non-metal together, it's ionic. Yeah, and for sure, you don't really need to look much further than those two things coming together. When you have two non-metals that are coming together, uh, that is going to be covalent, which means they're sharing electrons. That is why what we just saw when we talked about our polyatomic ions, for example, I drew this. Hydrogen is a non-metal, nitrogen is a non-metal. They're going to share electrons, basically. And that's why those polyatomic ions, which are all non-metals, actually do share electrons because they have the same sort of periodic trends where they both want to hang on to their electrons and not really give away their electrons. So they end up sharing. And again, in the case of polyatomic ions, they actually have just an overall charge because of that. General rule is things with low ionization energy will tend to make cations or positively charged ions. Things with negative electron affinities will tend to form anions. Ionization energy, again, is the energy required to remove an electron, uh, which is basically when that happens, you become positively charged, which is what a cation is. Electron affinity is the energy change that occurs uh, when somebody gains an electron, which is basically what happens with an anion, which is why they become negatively charged. All right, so general rule tells us pretty much our guys in group one and two, our metals are going to be positively charged and our guys in sort of the non-metal region of the periodic table is going to be those negatively charged things. So let's take a look at an example of an ionic bond. And first off, I know this is an ionic compound because I see lithium, which is a metal. I see fluoride, which is fluorine, which is a non-metal. So once again, whenever that combo comes together, we are dealing with an ionic compound for sure. So if we look at each of these things here, our lithium is group number one, which means it should have one valence electron. And by the way, it has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s1. And this would be the one valence electron that we see there in the picture. Fluorine is group number seven, which means it should have seven valence electrons. And it has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. And it is these seven right here that are the dots that we see in terms of our configuration. So I know I got my metal, which does a metal want to hang on to its electrons or give them away? Metals want to give them away. They have very low ionization energy. It doesn't take a lot of convincing. I have a non-metal which really wants to grab some electrons. So that's exactly what's going to happen when these two guys come together. The lithium is going to go take my electron, please. The fluorine will go, no problem, happy to help. That's the actual conversation that occurs there. The result of that is my lithium has now lost an electron, right? And now that it loses an electron, it becomes positively charged. And that means that my fluorine has now picked up an electron. Make it a different color there. And when it picks up that electron, it also becomes negatively charged in this case. And behold, that is a positive and a negative thing here. That is an ionic compound. Again, there is no sharing of electrons here, which is why when we draw Lewis symbols for this, you do need to include the charges. So typically speaking, we include the charges here because it's ionic. And a lot of times we put like a little bracket around one of them, maybe the negatively charged guy, just to indicate that there is no sharing of those electrons. There has been a complete transfer of electrons from one to the next. First off, any questions on that there? <clears throat> so what did we actually do here? Lithium laid off its one electron, which means this guy goes away, which means lithium with a plus one charge has an electron configuration of 1s2, who on the periodic table is number two. That is helium. Helium is what type of element? It is a noble gas, yeah? So lithium, by losing its one electron, becomes what is referred to as isoelectronic, like we talked about with electron configuration, has the same electron configuration as helium, makes it kind of happy. 
This is good for fluorine because in a P subshell, how many electrons can you put in there? Six. How many does it have right now? Five. That's good. One's coming over. That's going to work pretty well for it. It's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That's grand total of how many electrons? 10 total electrons. And number 10 on the periodic table is neon. That is also what type of element? Noble gas, hence the goal of bonding. They both just became, by donating its electron and accepting its electron, they both achieve noble gas configuration, and that makes it a very stable sort of bond to occur. And again, that is really the whole purpose of bonding is for them to end up with the same electron configuration as those noble gases. Once again, they are not turning into those noble gases because why? Are they still lithium and fluorine on the other side? They are because the only way an element will change elements is to change which thing? Starts with a P, protons, yeah? So no protons moving, just electrons. So they are still lithium and fluorine because they still have the same number of protons but they are similar to a noble gas now in terms of how many electrons they have. And that is the goal of bonding. So sometimes people misunderstand that, that they think like lithium now becomes helium or you know, fluorine now becomes neon. It doesn't, there's still those elements because there's no protons being touched anywhere here, but they're able to achieve the same electron configuration as noble gas. Question on that there. Okay, uh, let us continue on. So what we're looking at here is really, as I mentioned, the basis of all bonding, including ionic bonding. That is the ultimate goal. And that's something you should keep in your head because you know it'll help you sort of maybe uh, draw the correct structures and what you should end up with here. So we will always have this sort of transfer from the metal to the non-metal, really because of those periodic trends that we talked about where the metal really wants to get away with electrons and the non-metal really wants to accept those electrons. So once again, there is absolutely no sharing of electrons here between that lithium ion and the fluoride ion. It is that attraction between those two uh, that holds it together, which is sometimes referred to as electrostatic attraction. So again, the important part about an ionic bond is no sharing of electrons. And that is why when we draw these things sort of using Lewis dot symbols, we do need to include the charges. Later, when we talk about drawing covalent guys, you don't need to include the charges because they're sharing of electrons. There is no charge, but because these are ions, you do need to show them in your pictures. Questions on that there. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look at another example. Let's do calcium and oxygen. Uh, once again, I know this is ionic because I see a metal. I see a non-metal. And that tells me once again, we are dealing in an ionic situation where the metal should be transferring that electron over to the non-metal. So we'll start with calcium, which is group number two. And that means it's got two valence electrons, a little electron configuration for old time's sake here, a little argon, 4s2, a little shorthand there, if you will. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to do oxygen, which is group number six, which means it has six valence electrons, something like that. And a little 1s2, uh, 2s2, 2p4 action happening here. So once again, we have our metal and our non-metal coming together. We know that our metal is going to give away its electrons. So what's going to happen in this case is our calcium is going to transfer an electron. We'll go this way. By the way, if calcium only transfers one electron, we'll be happy. It will not, because if you look on the periodic table, one spot to the left of calcium is only potassium, which doesn't have that noble gas ring like something else, right? So it is going to want to lose both of its valence electrons in this case, and that's okay because our oxygen is going to be able to sort of handle that in this situation. When the calcium does so, it will lose two electrons, which means it will then become positively too charged for the two electrons that it lost. Our oxygen will pick up those two electrons. And because oxygen picked up two electrons, it will become negatively two charged. That works good. 
And again, there is no sharing of electrons here. Positive two, negative two is what's holding that together. If we look at our electron configuration, calcium gave away its two valence electrons, which are these, uh, which leaves it basically 18 electrons, which as you can see there means over here, it now has the same electron configuration as argon, which is a noble gas. As we just talked about, our P subshell could hold six total electrons, and that's good because calcium just sent over two more, right? So it has room for it right there to go in, and that means this becomes 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, the oxygen with a minus two charge. And once again, if we count up the top numbers, that's 6, 2, and 2, which is 10, which means that is the same as neon. So once again, here we see that both calcium and oxygen by gaining and losing electrons are able to achieve noble gas configuration, making it again, a, a very stable bond and a very stable sort of situation. Question on that. Now, what happens if we uh, combo a couple of things here, for example, let's say we took our calcium And we'll put it with our fluorine that we used earlier, which is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5 in this case. So again, we have a metal, which is calcium. We have fluorine, which is a non-metal. So we will expect the metal to transfer its electrons. So our calcium is going to transfer its electron over here to the fluorine. Can the fluorine take any more electrons? cannot is kind of full at that point and as we just talked about calcium is not going to be happy laying off just one electron right so in this case we actually need not one fluorine but we need two fluorines second one could take care of the second electron that will then give us calcium that was able to get rid of both of its electrons one to each fluorine and that will then give us not one but two fluorines where everyone draw it. I'll just draw it over here on this side here, the other one. Now, in terms of this, what has happened is the calcium gave away both of these electrons, which means it was able to get to argon's configuration. Each of the fluorines was able to pick up one electron in that P subshell which got it to basically 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, our neons configuration. And this guy was able to get to neons configuration. All three of those guys were able to achieve noble gas configuration by gaining and losing electrons. First off, any questions on that? How does this tie into what we were just talking about? When I take an ion like calcium, and I take an ion like fluoride and I put them together, the overall charge is equal zero. That means I need two of those. That is the real reason why you need the overall charge to equal zero in the simplest way possible. Because when you put them together in the simplest way possible, the positive and the negative, what you're essentially doing is allowing each of those things to get to noble gas configuration. So that's why when we talk about naming and we have a positive guy and a neg negative guy, and we want to put them together in the simplest way to get to zero. It is basically because of the bonding aspect here. It allows everybody to reach noble gas configuration. Well, uh, yeah, th uh, that would be the formula, right? Like we were just talking about yeah. with naming. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. Was that, was that, I, I just didn't finish writing it. But yeah, that would be the formula like we were talking about with naming. And that's really the real reason why they say, you know, when you put something that's positive and negative together, you need to equal zero. The real reason is actually the bonding reason here. By doing so, it allows, again, everybody to reach that noble gas configuration. And again, if we didn't put them equal to zero, you know, for example, if we wrote, you know, CA uh, F plus, right? That means I only have one of these fluorines, one of these calciums. 
that means that calcium would not have been able to get rid of its second electron, which means it didn't get to noble gas configuration, not a very stable thing. So again, these two things do tie together the writing of the ionic compound to equal zero and really the bonding aspect of it. They're really one and the same. The purpose of it is to get everybody to that noble gas configuration. And that's why when we put them together in our formulas, we want it to equal zero in the simplest way possible to achieve that. Any questions on that there? Yeah. You probably uh, wouldn't necessarily put a two as a subscript, but you could put a two in front. Sometimes people will do put a two in front. So to answer your question, yeah. You, but in this situation, they'd probably put it as a big two in front. Yeah. But yeah, you could do that as well. Other questions? All right. So these are obviously all examples of ionic compounds. Again, transfer of electrons, opposites attract, holding together. Once again, absolutely positively no sharing of electrons in an ionic uh, bond. Any questions on that there? Uh, oh, some fun drawing, there we go. All right, then let's switch over to the other type of bonding uh, where my dots got all over the place, but we'll try to fix them here maybe. That line totally missed. All right, so let's talk about covalent bonding. And covalent bonding is usually between two nonmetals. And the difference between covalent bonding and ionic bonding is here we do have sharing of electrons. And as we'll talk about here, the sharing of electrons may be equal sharing or it may be unequal sharing, but there is some aspect of sharing that occurs uh, when we put two nonmetals together. So this kind of all messed up. I think it's okay on your handout, but I'm gonna just redraw it here. Uh, if we have hydrogen coming together with hydrogen, so here's the deal with when we put two nonmetals together. When we put two nonmetals together, they're basically in the same spot on the periodic table, uh, which means they both have the same sort of periodic trends. And basically, that means that they both want to hang on to their electrons and take somebody else's electrons. So once again, the best thing that could kind of happen when two nonmetals get together is neither one of them is going to give away their electrons. They're going to agree to share them. So there's going to be some aspect of sharing that's going to happen. So with our hydrogen here, they definitely have the exact same periodic trends. And they're going to actually share this electron, which will result in a covalent bond happening, which you could represent as dots are very commonly with covalent bonding. The bond is represented with a line. So one line represents a covalent bond. And that represents two dots. That's what's referred to as a single bond. We can also have a double bond, which is two lines represented by basically four dots, which is a double bond. And there's also a triple bond, which is represented by three lines, which is equivalent to six total electrons or three pairs of electrons. And that's a triple bond. So unlike ionic bonds where we have the electrons being transferred from one to the next, on a covalent bond, we have the sharing. So the sharing is important because those electrons are sort of equally attracted to the nucleus in each of the atoms. So it's kind of like attracted to this nucleus, attracted to the other nucleus, and that's sort of what locks those electrons in place between the two atoms. So when we count the electrons for the hydrogen on the left, he's got two electrons when we count for the hydrogen on the right, because they're sharing, he has also two electrons. And that's really good for hydrogen because again, hydrogen only needs how many electrons to be good? Two, yeah. So it's able to achieve noble gas configuration. And this is how nonmetals do it by making a covalent bond and by sharing electrons allows them to achieve that noble gas configuration as opposed to an ionic bond where we need to transfer electrons to achieve that. So here by sharing electrons, they're able to get to that happy place. Essentially it allows hydrogen to get to helium sort of electron configuration. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now a covalent bond, as I mentioned, is uh, basically attracted to both of the nucleuses. And again, that is what holds it together uh, when they do come together is that sort of mutual attraction to each of the nucleuses sort of keeps them in place between the two and keeps everybody sort of locked into place. 
So if we look at another example here, like F2, uh, we look at the electron configuration. Again, fluorine is group seven, which means it has seven valence electrons. And if we put it together with another fluorine, once again, they are both fluorines, which means they're identical to each other in terms of their properties. So they are definitely going to share the electrons here. That's going to result in a bond being formed between the two fluorines, which you could represent with all dots if you like dots. You could also, again, represent the bonding part of it with a line, which represents the two dots, like so. But more importantly, by sharing those electrons between the two fluorines, uh, each of the fluorine basically gets to count those two for themselves, which means that the fluorine on the left there ends up with eight electrons. Fluorine on the right ends up with eight electrons. And again, eight is obviously the same as the noble gases on the periodic table. And hence the purpose of covalent bonding is we're going to get to that noble gas configuration by sharing electrons as opposed to transferring electrons. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Go. So when we look at this sort of structure here, there are different types of electrons. Uh, there are all the dots. And when we look at the dots, they are not involved in bonding. Uh, so they are called lone pairs. I, I'll call them lone pairs. But nowadays, most books will call them non-bonding electrons. So if I say uh, lone pairs is the same thing as non-bonding electrons, there are basically the electrons that are not involved in a bond. So that would be all these guys that are dots would be our non-bonding electrons. We also have obviously some electrons that are involved in a bond, which are represented by the line here. And those guys also have a super creative name. Those are what are referred to as bonding electrons. Very creative there. That is bonding electrons. When you draw Lewis structures, you should always include all of the bonding electrons and all of the non-bonding electrons. Non-bonding electrons are always showed as dots. Bonding electrons, it is your call. It could be shown as dots or lines. I personally use lines for bonding electrons, and a lot of people use lines for bonding electrons, but uh, it's not wrong to use dots for those as well. Uh, but definitely you should use dots for non-bonding electrons, so no lines for those. It makes me think of a bad organic flashback when people use lines. So dots for non-bonding, and uh, lines are dots for bonding electrons, which obviously are part of a bond between two atoms. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so a Lewis structure, again, is a representation of covalent bonding where we use these Lewis dot symbols to represent them. It is also important to remember that, again, in these structures, it is just the valence electrons that are being shown. So all these atoms and elements, uh, all these atoms really have other electrons, those core electrons, but it is only those valence electrons, those highest energy electrons, that are involved in bonding. So if we take a look at something like water and we draw the Lewis structure here for water, it looks something like this. And in this case, the oxygen by sharing with both hydrogens is able to get to the eight electrons and each of the hydrogens sharing with the oxygen is able to get to two electrons each. And everybody is really happy in that situation with the two for the hydrogens and the eight there for the oxygens in this particular case. And that's the same thing, obviously, that we see with our fluorine. And that brings us to, obviously, as we sort of been talking about it, uh, the two major rules for bonding. And that is, again, is the octet rule. Octet meaning eight. And it pretty much means in covalent bonding, what's going to happen is everybody's going to continue to make bonds until they get eight electrons around it. As we'll talk about, sometimes that requires just single bonds to do so. Sometimes it might require some double bonds to get there. And sometimes it may require some triple bonds to get to eight. But the goal is to get to eight to be like the noble gases, 
And obviously that is except our good friend once again, hydrogen that should only have two. And just a reminder, never ever draw hydrogen like this. Yes. Like I'm just gonna put everything on it. Yes, because you do get just a big X on that part. Yeah. By the way, hydrogen shouldn't look like this either. That's another X situation. So again, pretty much hydrogen should be on the outside. It looks something like that. One line to it, which represents two electrons. And that's all it should have. Or if you want to do it without the line, you could do the dots. But it should basically look like that. Yeah. Also, again, hydrogen should never find itself in like the center position because it will have too many bonds to it to begin with. So hydrogen should always be on the outside when you draw these type of structures. That is sometimes referred to as a duet rule, which means, again, hydrogen just needs to get to helium uh, to be good. All right, so we talked a little bit about our multiple bonds, but uh, that's a single bond. So again, a single bond in some cases is enough to get everybody to the octet rule. And a single bond, once again, is represented by a single line which represents basically one pair of electrons or two total electrons in that case. Now, sometimes like CO2 here uh, actually requires double bonds and actually requires two double bonds, one on each side uh, to get there. So our carbon dioxide actually has to double bond with oxygen on one side there to get to eight and also on the other side. So in this case, it actually needs to do a couple of double bonds here to get there. That gives the oxygens eight. And again, also gives carbon eight in the middle to do so. Without double bonding on both sides, in the case of carbon dioxide, it will not be able to achieve that octet rule and be happy. So it definitely needs to do that. A double bond, once again, is represented by uh, two lines most commonly. And that represents four total electrons or two pairs of electrons. Uh, in here. Now, in some cases, it does require a triple bond to get yourself to uh, that octet rule and something like nitrogen, for example, our uh, C2H2 is an example of that here, the nitrogen by sharing that triple bond, each of them ends up with eight. And in this case down here are carbons on each of these end up with eight and our hydrogens also end up with two in each of those cases that makes it happy. Triple bond once again represented by three lines are a total of six electrons are three pairs of electrons. By the way, if you draw a triple bond with just dots, you shouldn't just make them all in like one line. Yeah, so some type of stacking situation happening there if you draw them with dots. I will caution you that sometimes when people start drawing loose structures for covalent molecules, they want to double bond and triple bond right out of the box. Not a good idea. Yeah. So usually you want to save a double bond or a triple bond to try to fix something that's not correct. And so in most cases, you really don't want to be double bonding and triple bonding things out of the box. You really want to start with single bonds and kind of work your way to double bond or triple bond if necessary. And we'll talk about the proper order as to how to draw those things coming up. Uh, but just keep that in mind. Sometimes people just want to, I don't know, again, I think maybe they think more lines make it look more chemistry-like or something like that. So I keep adding lines. So when we are sharing electrons in a covalent bond, how do we know how the electrons are going to be shared? And really the overwhelming thing that we look at when we're trying to determine between two atoms how the electrons are going to be shared is electronegativity. And that really is the ability of an atom to bring electrons towards itself. And I think we talked about it when we were talking about some periodic trends. And when you look on the periodic table, it increases as you go up and to the right, and it decreases as you go down. The most electronegative element we could have is fluorine, actually. And if you look at the periodic table, fluorine is as far to the right as you could go without hitting a noble gas, which is not really interested in bonding because they're noble gases. So that's what everybody else wants to become like. So electronegativity is really what we look at to determine how these electrons are going to be shared between one another. So for example, when we look at a bond between hydrogen and itself, 
because they are both hydrogen, we would expect them both to basically pull those electrons that are being shared equally, right? So because they're both the same element, the electrons that are being shared there is going to be attracted to the hydrogen on the right and just as much attracted to the hydrogen on the left. And the result of that is we're going to actually end up with equal sharing of those electrons. And we will have basically the same sort of pull. So you can kind of think of it like a rope. Somebody pulls the rope this way and somebody pulls the rope this way and they're pulling equally. The rope is not going to really go anywhere, right? So um, it's pretty much equal sort of sharing of electrons. And this is what is referred to as a nonpolar really a nonpolar covalent bond, which is basically equal sharing of electrons. Most people just call it usually a nonpolar bond. They kind of leave the covalent part out of it. It's implied that it's covalent because it's sharing electrons. So most people will just call it nonpolar bond, but it really is a nonpolar covalent bond. The result of equal sharing of electrons is this. There is no side that is, you know, more positive or negative because there's an equal distribution of electrons within that bond. So basically it's kind of like a neutral bond. So, so, you know, there's no like negative positive side or anything like that happening because the electrons are basically distributed equally over that particular bond. That is the same thing that happens with F F2 as well. But if we were to swap this out, for example, with a fluorine, and we have the hydrogen fluorine sort of bond. Now between hydrogen and fluorine, the one that is more electronegative is which one? Is fluorine, it's the furthest up to the right there. And now when those electrons are being shared, they're gonna no longer be shared equally. They're gonna be way more attracted if my just scribble here is the attraction of the electrons hanging out versus the electrons hanging out over there by the hydrogen. They're going to basically migrate towards the fluorine because it is more electronegative. The result of this is these electrons, unlike an H2, will no longer be shared equally. If the electrons are moving towards the fluorine, will the fluorine be more positive or more negative? It will actually become more negative and it will pick up what is referred to as a partially negative charge. And then the hydrogen will become partially positive. The little symbol is a delta symbol. It means uh, partial negative and partial positive sort of charge. <clears throat> That means that this bond is no longer neutral. There is actually a more negative side to the bond and a more positive side to the bond because the electrons are no longer being shared equally. You could also represent this with what is referred to as a bond dipole arrow. And this arrow looks something like this. And it always points to the more negative side of the bond and the back part that looks like a plus. It's always to the more positive side of the bond, basically, when you do it. This type of unequal sharing creates what is referred to as a polar covalent bond. Our, most people will just call it a polar bond. So a nonpolar bond and a polar bond are both covalent bonds. There are both bonds where electrons are being shared. The difference between it is in a nonpolar covalent bond or a nonpolar bond, we have equal sharing of electrons, which creates like a neutral situation. In a polar covalent bond or a polar bond, we have unequal sharing of electrons. And because the electrons are hanging out on one side versus the other of the bond, that side becomes more negative and the other side becomes more positive. Any questions on that? Why is it only a partially negative charge and a partially positive charge rather than a full negative and a full positive charge? What do you think? Go free. You can only be wrong once unless you give two answers. Then you can be wrong twice. That's the absolutely right answer. So in this situation is
the electrons are still being shared in this situation. They haven't fully transferred. We only see the electrons fully transferring when we have an ionic bond where it goes from the metal to the non-metal. And in that situation, the metal becomes fully positively charged. The non-metal becomes fully negatively charged because it has fully lost and gained electrons. In a polar bond, even though they are being shared unequally, there is still some aspect of sharing. So it's like, you know, the tug of war thing where somebody pulls the rope mainly and the poor guy's just kind of hanging on a little bit. He's still hanging on, right? He's still got the rope. And that's still the situation here. Those electrons are still hanging on between the two, but they're not being shared equally. And that's why we only get a partially positive charge and a partially negative charge because there is still that aspect of sharing. It hasn't reached the point where they will jump from one to the next, which is what we see when a metal and a non-metal come together in an ionic bond. Any questions on that? <clears throat> So again, uh, as I mentioned, when we have something like HF, that is going to be our polar covalent bond, uh, again, creating a separation of charge uh, based on really which one ever is more electronegative will bring those electrons towards itself. And again, we can represent it two ways. Very commonly, you will see this arrow, which is sometimes referred to as a bond dipole arrow. And again, uh, points to the more negative side, and this side is the more positive side. <clears throat> so when we think about the three sort of different types of bonding, um, on one end of the extreme, if you will, we have an ionic bond. And with an ionic bond, that is always a metal and a non-metal where we have, again, the transfer of electrons from the metal to the non-metal. So we got that transfer of electrons and we create a cation, which is positively charged. We create an anion, which is negatively charged. And we have that complete transfer of electrons. We get the complete sort of positive and negative charges to occur. And an example of this, again, is something like sodium chloride metal and non-metal. On the other end of the extreme, we have a nonpolar bond or a nonpolar covalent bond, which is always between two non-metals. And here we have equal sharing of electrons. And again, that creates sort of like a neutral type bond where there is no charge happening. An example of that is again, like the H2 that we saw or the F2 are examples. And sort of in the middle of the two is a polar covalent bond or just a polar bond. Which is two non-metals together. And here we have unequal sharing of electrons. And that creates our partially positive, partially negative side. Obviously, this guy here being an example of that. And those are really the three different sort of types of bonding. Complete transfer of electrons, always metal and non-metal is where that's going to happen. Nice equal sharing of electrons between two nonmetals where they basically share very similar electronegativity values. And in the middle, not a transfer of electron, not perfectly equal sharing of electrons, but there's some aspect of sharing and it's going to be unequal, which is a polar bond. But again, not so unequal sharing that it completely transfers like we see in the ionic bond, but not perfect equal sharing like we see over there in like the nonpolar bond. Any questions on the three different types of bonds? So anything with covalent, again, is two non-metals, yeah? Anything ionic is metal and non-metal. So again, that's a big distinction, obviously, between those two as well. Any questions on that? <clears throat> so how do we know when we sort of uh, put things together, will we get you know, these electrons to share equally? Will we get them to share unequally? 
And it really is that electronegativity that helps us determine, you know, if we put these two things together, what should we expect to happen in terms of the electrons? Should we get the sharing of electrons equally? Should it be unequally? And that electronegativity, as I mentioned, is really the overwhelming thing that we look at to help us make that decision. And again, as we talked about up and to the right, it increases on the periodic table, down and to the left, it decreases. The electronegativity of an element is related to electron affinity, and that's the, basically the ability when they gain electrons, the energy change, and the ionization energy. So fluorine has a high electron affinity, which means it likes electrons, likes to gain electrons, has a high ionization energy, which means it doesn't like to get rid of its electrons. It's very hard to do so. And it has a high, a little too many O's there, electronegativity, um, which means it also likes to bring electrons towards itself. Um, sodium, on the other hand, which is our metal, has low electron affinity. It's really not interested in bringing electrons to itself. It has low ionization energy, which means it doesn't take a lot of convincing to remove electrons. And it has low electronegativity, which means it's not interested in bringing electrons at all towards itself. So they have very opposite things. And that's why when we put those things together, like a metal and a non-metal, we do get the transfer of electrons because, again, metals are pretty much willing to give them away. Non-metals really want to sort of grab electrons. So that is why we get the transfer of electron and ionic bond. While in a covalent bond, because it's two non-metals together, they both basically, again, want to hold on to their electrons. So sharing is the best that can sort of happen in that situation. So can we determine ionic bond, covalent bond, polar bond, or nonpolar bond? We can. A guy by the name of Pauling came up with really a method to determine what type of bond that you would end up with. And he came up with values of electronegativity for the elements. His values run from zero to four. Four is the most electronegative. And zero, not so much. So uh, fluorine, for example, has a value of four, which is why it's the most electronegative. And as we go to the left, our guys have uh, much lower values on the periodic table. You could use what is referred to as the change in electronegativity values. That's what the delta symbol is, change. En is electronegativity values. You basically could subtract the two elements that are in the bond and figure out what number you get. You just subtract a larger number from the smaller, so you get a positive. And if you get a difference between 0 to 0 0.4, that is considered a nonpolar bond which means equal sharing of electrons. It's covalent. They're going to be sharing those electrons equally. If you get a difference in electronegativity that is above 0 0.4 to below 2, that is going to be a polar covalent bond or just a polar bond. That's going to result in unequal sharing of electrons. And if you go typically above 2, but not in all cases, you will get an ionic bond, which means we're not going to share electrons, but we're going to have electrons basically being transferred from the metal to the non-metal. Couple of things about this. Frankly, the ionic thing doesn't work perfectly. It's, so there are some that are a difference less than two. You don't really need the electronegativity values to determine ionic because the only thing you need to know for an ionic bond is what two things should be there. Metal and a... It's ionic. You don't even need the value. So again, put ionic, move on with your life. It'll be okay. You don't need to worry about it too much. So the other thing that you'll sometimes come across is if you end up with a delta, a change in electronegativity of exactly zero, that is sometimes referred to as a pure covalent bond. That's like as equal sharing electrons as you could get. It is still a nonpolar bond, but some books and some people will sort of secondary classify it as a pure covalent bond. And that just means that it is like the perfect equal sharing of electrons. As you can see, our nonpolar bond, which is equal sharing of electrons, goes from zero to 0.4, which means if I have a 0.4 difference, are they perfectly sharing electrons in that case? They're not, there is some difference, right? So that's why sometimes people will classify somewhere where you have a difference that's perfectly zero, all right, exactly zero as being a pure covalent bond, but it's still a nonpolar bond, it's still equal sharing of electrons.
any questions on those there. So here's a table of electronegativity values, another table, maybe one more table. Oh, let's go with this one. It has nicer colors. I think it's got purples and stuff. So these are some values of electronegativity for uh, each of these elements. They obviously would be provided for you if you needed them. Um, but you can see as you go up and to the right, we got our number four up there. And as you come this way, it is obviously a lot less closer to zero, less electronegative. That's our metals on this side, non-metals up there. So if we look at the few that we uh, looked at here, we take our sodium chloride, for example, we take our HF and we had say, we'll do our F2, why not? So if we were going to figure out sort of our, what type of bond we got going on here, once again, if it's anywhere from zero to 0 0.4 going to be nonpolar anywhere from 0 0.5 really to below two going to be polar and above two will be ionic so if we take fluorine for example values four so that is going to be four for this guy four for this guy the change in electronegativity would be four minus four which is zero difference of zero means it is a non-polar bond, right? It's also a pure covalent bond, perfect equal sharing of electrons. In this case, we would expect it to be a non-polar bond between those two. If we look at hydrogen, which is uh, 2.1 from the table and fluorine, which is four, we take the difference in electronegativity, that is four minus 2.1. That's a lot of math there. I'm gonna go with 1.9 on that. 1.9 is below two, right? And that means that it is a polar bond, which is what we would expect it to be. With again, the fluorine being more electronegative. And if we look at our sodium chloride, our sodium is 0.9. Our chlorine is uh, three. That's gonna give us a difference in electronegativity of three minus 0 0.9. Once again, just take the larger number minus the smaller. 2.1, that is above two, which means it's ionic. Now you can again get a difference where it's below two. So you, you really don't need it. Um, you can see it's a metal, non-metal, it's gonna be ionic. You really don't even need the values in that case. That is how you use that table. Any questions on that? Why don't you try some here? Tell me, is the bond between these guys polar, nonpolar, or ionic? If you have a bond between carbon and oxygen, carbon and hydrogen, uh, let's do sulfur and oxygen. And let's do uh, carbon and sulfur. And let's do... Uh, Let's do potassium and chlorine. All right, so each of those calculates the difference in electronegativity values and determine is it ionic, polar, or nonpolar. See what you come up with here. And that is going to give us a difference of one. And one would mean that it is, what's that bond? It is going to be a polar bond. Which one's more electronegative here? is the oxygen, which means if we were to draw that arrow, it would actually point towards the oxygen, which is more negative in that side. That means oxygen here would be more negative in that bond, right? And the carbon would be more positive. If we look at carbon, which again is uh, 2.5 and hydrogen, which is 2.1. And if we take the difference there in electronegativity, is just subtract it right there. That's gonna give me a 0 0.4 difference. 0 0.4 is a non-polar bond. That is why the cutoff is, is actually at 0.4 because of carbon hydrogen. Pretty much all organic molecules contain carbons and hydrogens and they're non-polar. And that's why the cutoff actually goes up to 0.4 for that. So we would expect equal sharing of electrons here. Um, so there would technically be no side that's more positive or negative. It'd be kind of a neutral sort of bond in that sense. If we go to carbon and We'll go sulfur and oxygen. Sulfur is uh, 2.5. Oxygen is 3.5. Again, the difference here in electronegativity ends up being 3.5 minus 2.5, which is one, which once again means this should be polar bond. 
the more electronegative being the oxygen, so it would point there. We do not draw lines for nonpolar bonds because there is no negative or positive side. So that line is only, our arrow is really only drawn for things that are polar. Uh, if we do our potassium, which is 0 0.8, our chlorine, which is three, difference in electronegativity is three minus 0 0.8, 2.2, yeah. That's going to be ionic. Really didn't need this because that is a metal and that is a non-metal. So we know it's ionic anyways without it. We look at carbon here, that is 2.5 and sulfur is 2.5. That means the change in electronegativity here is going to get us a zero, which means this bond is, yeah, it's a pure non-polar bond or just non-polar bond. This is a good demonstration that for sure you can have uh, two elements, that obviously two bonds, two atoms that are the same element will share the electrons equally and be nonpolar. But you could also have two atoms that are different elements that can share it. And that's because of the relationship on the periodic table is what's sometimes referred to as a diagonal relationship. Carbon is further up, but sulfur is further to the right. They cancel out their differences and they end up as 2.5 each. We also see that with nitrogen and chlorine. So it's not directly diagonal, it's kind of down and over one is the relationship, yeah. We, we don't because there's no sharing of electrons and that's really what that bond represents is uh, a polar covalent bond, which means there's sharing of electrons. We would put the actual charges in if we were to draw, you know, those sort of things. All right, a couple of things before we finish up here is, do we always need the numbers? The answer is you don't always need the numbers. You could use the general trend in electronegativity that is up and to the right is more electronegative and down to the left is at least less or negative. For example, if we're comparing our carbon and oxygen, they are in the same row on the periodic table, which means oxygen is further to the right, which means they're not gonna share equally, it's going to be polar. If we look at uh, oxygen and sulfur, they're in the same group on the periodic table, which means oxygen is further up, uh, which means it's going to be more electronegative and they will not share equally and it will be a polar bond. So if there's something you're comparing that's in the same row or the same group on the periodic table, probably going to be polar. You can make a pretty good assumption without the actual numbers involved. Any questions on how to do this? One last thing about this, this is specifically when we use technically the difference in electronegativity. This is specifically what is sometimes referred to as bond polarity. And all we're trying to figure out is between these two atoms, are they going to share electrons equally or unequally? That's basically what this tells us. There's only one place where it will actually tell us the entire